talk about assessing the head and neck. During this module, we'll talk about anatomy, taking a history, and doing a physical exam on this body system. Let's start first with anatomy. When you have findings on the head, the scalp, underneath the hair, as well as the face, you need to be able to refer to the skeletal bones underneath so that you can document exactly at which landmarks those findings occurred. So make sure you know these terms and what portions of the head they refer to. So now let's talk about history and what subjective data you need to gather about this body system. In terms of the history for the head and neck, as with every body system, you're gonna be asking about the past medical history, any serious medical history, such as cancer, heart disease, pneumonias, as well as chronic things like asthma or thyroid. Specifically to the head, think about asking about migraines, histories of headache, any concussions, history of brain injury or head injury, as well as past surgical histories, of course. You want to know about family medical history, particularly in terms of the head. Think about migraine, brain cancers, neurological diseases. As with every body system, you're going to ask your patient about what medicines they're on, a prescription as well as over-the-counter and herbal remedies, and what allergies they have to medications or foods. You're going to ask a review of systems. So besides the head and neck, are they having trouble with movement? Are they having pain anywhere in their body? Are they having trouble with breathing? Or are they having trouble with urination, with digestion, skin changes, anything sort of head to toe that may or may not be relevant, you want to make sure and capture that. Then you want to specifically ask about symptoms regarding the head and the neck. So have they had any pains, specifically to the head, sinus pressure, pruritus around the head or neck, any lesions, any lumps or bumps, stiffness in the neck or neck pain. Anytime your patient has a symptom, of course, you're going to do a full symptom analysis. So tell me more about that headache. Where exactly in your head do you feel it? How long does it last? When did it start? Is it intermittent or constant? What's the quality of the pain? Is it burning, throbbing, achy or dull? And we'll grade that pain on a scale of 0 to 10. If 0 is no pain at all and 10 is the worst pain you can imagine, what number is it? Does it say the same number throughout the headache or does it gradually build or gradually improve? What helps it improve? What triggers it? All of your old CART or your PQRST, however you decide to organize the symptom analysis, you want to get all of those variables of the symptom. Another piece of history we need to gather is this person's tobacco use history. If they have ever smoked full calculated pack years, and this helps us quantify their risk for tobacco related diseases. Starting the physical exam of the head, we're going to inspect the scalp. If you're lucky enough to have your patient be bald, it's fairly easy to inspect the scalp. Most of us have hair on our head, so you're going to want to use gloves because you're looking really closely throughout all of the hair and you don't know what you're going to find. It could be that there's um, bleeding or an open lesion or lice, so you want to have gloves on when you start. You're looking for any discoloration, lesions, bumps, you want to pay attention, particularly when you're concerned about lice, to the nape of the neck here and around the ears. Oftentimes that's where lice likes the best. So you're going to sometimes find lice or nits there when they're not fully distributed in the rest of the head. Notice if this person has any alopecia or patches of baldness or male pattern baldness, any scars from old injuries on the scalp or any new findings. If you discover lesions on the head, make sure that you describe them just like you learned in the skin module. All the descriptors of the lesions you need to document. The location, the color, the size, the elevation of lesions, describe the border, describe the distribution if there's more than one lesion, are they dry, are they moist, and so on. Notice the condition of the scalp itself. Is it intact? Is it flaking? Is it scraped? Are there any lacerations? And then you also want to palpate the head, not just for slumps, but also to see the shape of the head. Is it normocephalic? Here's some pictures of head shapes. We often think about this in terms of newborns. It's sort of easiest to see in a newborn. Many newborns are born with an odd-shaped head for various reasons or develop an odd-shaped head during their neonatal period. However, they tend to grow out of them. Many adults do have an odd-shaped head, and so you want to be able to say that it's 
either normocephalic or a non-normocephalic head. What shape is it? Is the hair clean? Is there dirt, grease? What's the odor? Then we're going to move on to the face. Important things to notice about the face are, is it symmetrical? Is the skin intact? Are there any lesions, abrasions, moles? Is there symmetry to the face? When the person is speaking, smiling or frowning, is there symmetry on both sides? Is there equal movement on both sides? Sometimes you can't quite tell what's wrong. Something seems odd about their face and then you realize, if you look at it a little bit more, more closely, it's one side is moving and the other side isn't. So you really need to assess that. Could be a stroke, could be Bell's palsy. We don't know, we're gonna gather more data. Notice the facial expression. Does it match the mood of the conversation? What is their affect? Remember that an emotion is the patient's subjective assessment of how they're feeling. Affect, with an A, is the nurse's observation of their facial expression. Do they seem sad? Do they look happy? Do they look with a flat affect? Do they seem angry? What does their face look like to the nurse? That's affect. We're also going to palpate or percuss in the areas of the frontal and maxillary sinuses. Sometimes if someone has sinusitis or another problem, they can have pain with that maneuver. Generally, it should be non-tender. Examining the neck include inspection, palpation, and range of motion. So for inspection, we want to see is the neck symmetrical? In looking behind the patient, if they have long or big hair, you're going to ask them to put it back or you can hold it back. To really notice the trapezii and the sternomastoid muscles. Is one side more bulked out than the other? Put your hand on those muscles. Are there spasms? Are they relaxed? Is there an atrophy or hypertrophy in an area? Are there any lesions? Is the skin intact all the way around the neck, the sides, posterior and anterior aspects of the neck? And you want to document, of course, any lesions that you find. You're going to ask your patient to do certain range of motion exercises. So flexion, extension, hyperextension, lateral bending, that's ear to shoulder, and lateral twisting, that's chin to shoulder. Do they have any limitations in these maneuvers? If so, what? Are they limited to pain? Are they limited to stiffness or both? Palpate three things in the neck. You're going to palpate the lymph nodes in the neck. Make sure that you are able to name and locate all of these lymph nodes. In general, in a healthy person, those lymph nodes will not be palpable. You still need to document that you did it so the documentation is non-palpable, not non-palpated, because non-palpated means you didn't do it. But if you are feeling in the right place and you have to practice a lot and know that you're in the right place, you can document non-palpable in these areas. We palpate for lymph nodes because in certain infectious diseases and sometimes in cancer, our lymph nodes get swollen, enlarged, sometimes tender, sometimes fixed. They're not freely mobile, and sometimes they can get even hard. So first, you're going to assess whether any of those lymph nodes are palpable. If they are palpable, then you have three more variables you need to document. Are they enlarged? Probably they are if they're palpable. Are they fixed or freely moving? And are they hard, firm, or boggy? You can use your hand to feel these different consistencies. So is it the consistency of a knuckle, hard, consistency of a muscle, firm, or consistency of a fat pad, boggy? It looks like you have a lot of lymph nodes to memorize, but it's not quite as hard as it looks. You know a lot of these words already, and you can figure out a lot of where these lymph nodes are and can remember their names because of the roots and suffixes and prefixes. First of all, if you know that auricular means of the ear, we've got preauricular, which is anterior to the ear, and postauricular nodes behind the ear. We have occipital nodes near the occiput of the head. We have superficial cervical. So cervical means neck, and superficial refers to being superficial over that sternomastoid muscle. We've also got posterior cervical node, posterior to that muscle, supraclavicular node, so above the clavicle. And in fact, there's infraclavicular nodes just below the clavicle, but technically those aren't in the neck, right? They're in the, in the trunk, in the chest, in the thorax, at the corner of the jaw, inferior to the earlobe. You've got the jugular digastric node. If that is sometimes also called the tonsillar node because it often will swell with a tonsillitis. You've got 
the submandibular nodes that are just below the mandible, inferior edge of the mandible, and submental nodes. Mental, in this case, refers to the chin. When we're done palpating the nodes, you can move on to check the thyroid. Thyroid check is often done by nurse practitioners as opposed to nurses, but as far as I know, it's still on the NCLEX, so I want you to know about it. The thyroid is this gland that's shaped kind of like a bow tie. The lateral aspects of the thyroid are tucked under the sternomastoid muscles. It's a little bit mobile, so you can push one side and the opposite side will sort of peek out from the sternomastoid muscle and it's a little bit easier to palpate one side when you're pushing on the other side. We want to know three variables about palpation of the thyroid. One, is it enlarged? Two, is it symmetrical? And three, can you palpate nodes? Is it nodular? And this is a kind of exam that takes practice. You don't really have a good sense of what you're feeling until you've felt 20 or 30 or 40 thyroids. It's not all that much fun to have your thyroid palpated, but it shouldn't hurt. Now there's different ways to do this. I recommend using the pads of your fingers. They're the most sensitive. So you can pick up nodules, for instance, easiest with the pads of your fingers. You can use what's called the posterior approach. So behind the patient, using the pads of your fingers on the front of their neck and push to one side and palpate and push to the other side and palpate. Personally, I'm not real fond of this. It's hard enough for someone to have their hands on your neck, but coming up behind them just seems particularly, I don't know, unpleasant. So what I prefer is the anterior approach. And what I do is just flip my hands over so I can still use the finger pads of my hands to feel that thyroid. Use whatever approach works for you. Make sure you get consent before you put your hands on someone's neck though. If someone has an enlarged thyroid, it can be related to a number of different things. An enlarged thyroid is called a goiter. It could be a result of hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, or it could be thyroid cancer. So anytime you get any asymmetry, enlargement, or nodules on a thyroid, it necessitates further workup, and you'll get help from your team on that. But they'll think you're awesome because you picked it up. Gently palpate your patient's trachea. We expect it to be midline, but it may be deviated in certain conditions, especially certain lung diseases or injuries. We'll also need to palpate our patient's carotid pulse bilaterally. Note rate, rhythm, and force. Make sure you do this only on one side of the neck at a time, and palpate low on the neck. Avoid the baroreceptors high on the carotid. If you accidentally press on them, you could cause bradycardia, and next thing you know, your patient has passed out. Not good technique. Listen with the bell of your stethoscope to detect any carotid buoys if they're present. That concludes the assessment of the head and neck. Check out the other videos for detailed assessment of the eyes, ears, nose, and mouth. Mm -hmm.